Good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin Penfold, and I have the pleasure of being the parish director here at the Sacred Grace Inglewood. Tonight, I will be giving a short homily on the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that we say each and every week here at church. And so I want to be going through this. And before we start, because this is a prayer and because recently we have had some experience with meditating on portions of Scripture during our season of Lent, I'd like to start this evening by reading through and listening to the Lord's Prayer in a few different translations and versions. So please close your eyes, take a deep breath, listen to these words, and meditate upon this prayer. This in the NIV. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This in the NASB. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This from the New English Translation. Our Father in heaven, May your name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we ourselves have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And lastly, the version that we pray each Sunday, which comes from the Book of Common Prayer. We pray this together with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Tonight, we will be looking through the prayer that Jesus taught those he called brothers and sisters and friends. Each step along the way, we will be showing you the things that Jesus encourages those people to pray, and he encourages them to pray it often. We will also be looking at the introduction into the prayer and the conclusion that Jesus puts on the end of the prayer, two parts which were actually quite challenging for me and maybe challenging for you as well. The introduction to the prayer in the NASB translation says this, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Honestly, the first thing that I thought of when I read this was, don't we repeat prayers all the time? Should we not be saying this prayer or many of the other prayers that we say here at the Sacred Grace each week? Are we not supposed to say these over and over again? Wouldn't this just be the repetition like the Gentiles do? But two things come to mind. One encouragement and one warning. I need to remind myself of this, of this encouragement, that repetition is different than rhythm. The prayers that the Gentiles would say would be repeating incantations where they'd be trying to perfectly recite the same thing over and over again, hoping that the gods they were praying to would hear them. But they would need to get it just right in order for it to happen. So they would repeat it over and over again. Their goal was to repeat the prayer over and over and to get it right. It wasn't about it taking root in their hearts or in their lives or anything like that. On the contrary, what Christians have been doing for 2,000 years and what we continue to do each Sunday is that we pray in a way of rhythm so that our hearts would be changed and so that our lives would be changed. It's not about getting it right or hoping that God will hear us, but instead it's about the formation of our hearts and the formation of our lives. Because the words that we say with our mouths begin to take root in our hearts and change the way that we live. This isn't mindless repetition that brings our mind to something else. It instead brings our focus 
back onto God and onto ourselves in the way that we live. But also number two, and this is the warning, it's also easy for our rhythms to become repetition. Anna Case Winters is a Presbyterian minister and professor of theology, and she writes this in her book on Matthew. We may fail to consider carefully what it is we are saying and what we are praying this way might actually imply for how we live our lives. How may we come to place to a place where we not only know it by heart, but pray it from the heart so that it has real impact on our lives? How may we come to live as we pray? Even when I'm trying to do my best to have a life of rhythm, there's sometimes where it becomes a life of repetition. It can still become easy to fall asleep at the wheel and forget the meaning of the things that I say and have it not come from the heart. My hope tonight is that as we dig deeper and we try to understand what it is that the Lord's Prayer means, I hope that it uh, takes root in your heart, it takes root in your life, and that you have a better understanding of what it says so that instead of it just becoming repetition, it can truly be a rhythm for you. So it starts off like this. Our Father, who art in heaven. Jesus begins by reminding those who were surrounding him there on that hill, on that mountainside, that they have a Father in heaven. And it's that Father in heaven who they are praying to. The metaphor of God as Father is one that is all throughout the Old Testament. And God continually calls the Israelite people his children. He takes care of them like a father takes care of his children. He protects them and he guides them on where they should go. This metaphor also carries into the New Testament, where Jesus refers to God as his father, other people refer to Jesus as being the son of God, and then the New Testament writers continue to take this image and take this metaphor and really focus on it. John, in his first letter, writes this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Next, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed isn't exactly a word that we use very often. It's not really in our common vernacular, but it means to make or treat as holy. We are praying that God's name would be made holy. And so begins a theme that I see all the way throughout the Lord's Prayer. Our requests in the Lord's Prayer require our participation for them to be fulfilled. How then can we make the name of God holy? I'm... Uh, not really one to point to the Ten Commandments all that often. I know that there's a lot of other Christians that point to them all the time, uh, but that's not really something I'm in the habit of doing. But it is there that we see this command from God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. While many interpret this verse to mean something like not using the Lord's name when you curse or not making any promises in the Lord's name, Instead, I think a better way of understanding it is actually to say that those who live their lives in a way that does not reflect God accurately are taking the Lord's name in vain. God revealed to his people who he was. He revealed to him to them what his name is. And if they are to be people who are known by his name and then live in a way that does not accurately reflect him, well, then they are bringing shame upon that name. They're living and taking the Lord's name in vain. Jesus here requests that the name of God be made holy. And it is up to us, it is up to our participation to reflect the true nature of God as the ones who bear his name. And in doing so, we declare that his name is holy. Our request for God's name to be made holy requires our participation for it to be fulfilled. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When does the will and kingdom of God uh, come here on heaven? And and how how does it come here on on earth as the same way that it is in heaven? And how can we be participation? How can we be participating in this and bringing this about? These are all really difficult questions. We pray that the Lord's kingdom come here and his will be done. And it's something that we repeat each and every week. But we're not really asking for God to show up in a miraculous way with his power and his might forcing his will upon the world. Instead, we pray that his kingdom would come and that the words that we say with our mouths would begin to take root in our lives and it changes how we live so that we bring about the kingdom and we bring about God's will here on earth. Each week in our prayers of the people, we say, strip from us our complacency and apathy. 
which prevent us from joining you in establishing your kingdom and your will in Inglewood as it is in heaven. Establishing God's kingdom means bringing about justice and peace. It means seeing that the poor and the meek are the blessed ones. And it is about first being about the first being last and the last being first. These are the actions which we are called to establish here in Inglewood as they are in heaven. Our request for the Lord's kingdom and will requires that our participation happen for it to be fulfilled. Give us this day our daily bread. Just like the Israelites who were wandering around in the desert had to trust God for their daily provision and for their daily food, we too are to turn our hearts and our trust towards God for what we need. While the provisions of the Israelites came through manna, which fell down from heaven, our provisions today are usually from the generous actions of others, and others' provisions are usually from our generous actions. Not one of us saw the full impact of the coronavirus coming. School closures, job loss, evictions, and countless other tragedies and shortages have been the result. Thankfully, uh, the reason why I and my family have all that we need right now is both because uh, of uh, small business loans and because of uh, receiving some money from the government so that we can keep on going. Thankfully, other people have received things as well from families, from, uh, from friends, from strangers, and many have received government relief in different ways. Maybe the reason why you are putting food on the table tonight is because a friend went out and they got groceries for you because your landlord deferred your rent, or because you have received unemployment benefits. None of us saw this coming, but even though we are separated by space and distance, I still feel closer to many of you than I ever have before. Not only because we are experiencing something similar at the same time, but because of the way that our church has come together, because of the way that our church has supported one another, and because of the way that we have supported this city. If you are still struggling to put food on the table or make your rent, please let us know. You can go to tsgeng.org slash requests or reach out to any of our staff or any of our elders and let us know what's going on. Unfortunately, we can't make any promises that we're able to help or do exactly what it is that you need, but we would love to know and we would love to do whatever it is that we can. In these ways, we supply for one another our daily bread. Our request for daily bread in the Lord's Prayer, requires our participation and often the participation of others for it to be fulfilled. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I realized while studying this and reading this section over and over again that I've actually been reading this portion of the prayer and praying this portion of the prayer wrong for basically my entire life. The word as in the middle uh, made me think that I was asking God to forgive me while at the same time I'm trying to forgive others. Instead, the NIV showed me a bit more clearly what's happening here. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. It makes more clear in this version what the version that we pray on Sundays only implies. Our forgiveness of others is in the past tense. It's already been completed. Instead of asking God that he would uh, forgive me while I'm actively trying to forgive others. We are asking for God's forgiveness of our debts because we have already forgiven others' debts against us. Just like the rest of the Lord's Prayer, the request that we make will require our participation for it to be fulfilled. Instead of the ball being in God's court and saying, God, will you please forgive me while I'm trying to forgive others? Instead, the ball is in our court. We are saying, God, I have been forgiving others and I ask for you forgiveness as well. And this is something that we'll touch on again in Jesus' conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Bible is full of stories of where people are tempted. Often they are very much like the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And it follows a storyline that's usually something like this. A person sees something. A person decides that that thing is good for them. A person decides to take that thing for themselves. And that decision brings about lasting consequences and evil. A good example is King David. David saw Bathsheba on a roof. 
he decided that it would be good for him to sleep with her. He decided to take her for himself. And this leads to him raping Bathsheba and killing her husband. This progression of seeing, calling it good, taking it, and then receiving the evil consequences that happen is found all throughout scripture. But I've also seen it happen in my own life. I've seen ways in which I see something, I think that it's good for me. I take it, but then I receive the consequences and the people around me receive the consequences as well. It brings evil into my life and into the lives of others. Maybe you've seen that for yourself. You've seen something, you've taken something because you thought it was good. You've had it for yourself, but then it's brought evil consequences to you and those around you. So to not be led into temptation is to focus our lives instead on what God calls good, not what we think is good. And instead of bringing about evil, it brings about the goodness of God's kingdom. Our request to not be led into temptation requires our participation for it to be fulfilled. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This portion of the Lord's Prayer is not found in the earliest Greek manuscripts that we have. And it was probably an addition in the 4th or the 5th century as a closing doxology to the prayer. Though it is likely not original, it still has been part of the Christian church for over 1,500 years, and it's been part of church history that proclaims the truth of God. He is the true ruler and king. He is the one with ultimate power, and he is the one who deserves all the glory forever and ever. After teaching them this prayer, Jesus says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive you your sin. This is a good reminder of which part of Matthew we are in. We are in the part of Matthew that is known as the Sermon on the Mount, and this is what we're going through during our season of Eastertide. And Jesus is giving some very hard teachings, some very difficult things to hear, and some very difficult things to live out when he gives his Sermon on the Mount. I have found that this verse and many other verses like it in the Bible and in the Sermon on the Mount, it's not a dogmatic requirement pointing you to, the, to what you need to do in order to receive forgiveness or anything like that. Instead, it's pointing towards the type of heart that God desires and the type of people that God's people are supposed to be. These are the actions that are supposed to define God's people. This isn't a strictly if-then statement. Jesus is not laying down an ultimatum here where if you have a person sinning against you, if you don't forgive them, then God won't be forgiving you of anything. God doesn't have some sort of like secret scorecard that he's keeping where he knows every person that you haven't forgiven. And unless you get every single person on that secret list, then you're not gonna be forgiven either. Instead, ask yourself this. Could a person who does not forgive others truly understand what it means and to ask for forgiveness from God? Could a person who is defined by unforgiveness be truly repentant to God? I don't think they could. It's not about a scorecard. It's not about an ultimatum. It's about the simple fact that those who have forgiven others are those who can be truly repentant. And those who have received forgiveness are those who are able to give forgiveness to others. When I first began reading through this section, through the Lord's Prayer, and I came about this conclusion that Jesus puts on there, I was really confused. I was wondering why Jesus would be concluding this section about prayer with a command with how the people that follow him are supposed to live, how they're supposed to forgive. But as I read it over and over again, I began to see that this section, this conclusion, is just the same as the rest of the prayers. It requires our participation. We make God's name holy by living lives that are accurately portraying who God is. We bring about God's will and kingdom by doing his will and displaying his kingdom to others. We give and receive daily bread by caring for one another and by noticing the subtle ways in which God provides for us. We ask that we be forgiven of sins only after we have forgiven others of their sins. And we keep ourselves from temptation by seeking what God has called good, not what we perceive ourselves to be good. So it makes sense that Jesus would conclude his prayer as a reminder to his followers that their participation is required. Because our requests in the Lord's Prayer 
require our participation for them to be fulfilled.